Singer, too. I Did a lot better than uh, some of the uh, Hollywood <laughs> celebrities who have tried their uh, voice at that. I would think. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to him. That's going to do it for us, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. I'm Patrick Greenlaw. Inside Politics is coming up next. Now you needn't go to the symphony to hear the classics when you can own the collector's library of best-loved classics. This stupendous collection features every important category of classical music ever written. Best-loved overtures. Best-loved symphony. Best Love Concertos. And Best Love Dancers. Plus, you'll get Best Love Ballets and Best Love Piano Music. The Collector's Library of Best Love Classics is just $19.95. To order, call this toll-free number now. is CNN. While reaching out to middle America, George Bush takes a tough line against Iraq, and Dan Quayle takes a firm line on his future as VP. Republicans who back abortion rights kick off a caravan to drive home their message to the public and the party. And Bill Clinton courts divergent crowds in California, from the Urban League to the conservative suburban set. It's all part of Inside Politics 92. This is Inside Politics 92 with Catherine Cryer at the CNN Center in Atlanta and Bernard Shaw in Washington. Thanks for joining us. Inside Politics begins with an update from the campaign trail. Here's Patrick Greenlaw. Bernie, thank you. President Bush and his top advisors met tonight to discuss the situation in Iraq. Now, among those at the session were Secretary of State James Baker and Defense Secretary Dick Cheney. A White House spokeswoman said no decisions were made, but a CNN senior White House correspondent Charles Bierbauer reports the developments in Iraq are beginning to play a part in the presidential campaign. The Iraqi standoff is defused, but the Iraqi threat is not yet disarmed. Campaigning in Michigan, President Bush warned Saddam Hussein to toe the line. He's going to do it. He may not know it, but he is going to live up to those resolutions. And, uh... Bush says the Iraqi leader caved in on the inspection of the Agriculture Ministry, but the U.S. and U.N. have a catalog of other Iraqi violations. U.S. officials say Saddam Hussein's recent pattern of defiance has become more systematic and therefore more worrisome. The U.S. and its allies are concerned that if Iraq defies the U.N. resolutions, it will weaken the U.N. in its dealing with the problems of Yugoslavia and Somalia. Nor does President Bush want to be seen as weakened in his re-election campaign by a defiant Saddam Hussein. He better do what he right. He better do what he has to do. Thank you very much. The president has got to articulate it in such a manner that the American people do not feel they're being manipulated for political ends. I think he can make that case, uh, and I think that there's an excellent case, particularly when the UN is at stake. Bush has actually gotten support from Governor Bill Clinton and other Democrats. I have no quarrel with what they've done in this moment. I think that we had to put the pressure on him. We had to be firm with him. I doubt if this becomes a campaign issue. I hope it doesn't. Uh, I think it's very important not just that the world be united on this, but the United States be united on it. But of course, foreign policy is a campaign issue. In an oblique reference to Clinton, the president's been asking, whom do you trust when the White House hotline rings? And the American people need to know that the man who answers that phone has the experience, the seasoning, the guts to do the right thing. The president may find some encouragement in a CNN Gallup poll that shows 70% of Americans questioned favor military action to bring Iraq in line with UN resolutions 
and only 24% oppose. Just slightly less, 67%, support the U.S. resuming military action to force Saddam Hussein from power. Such action remains a possibility. From here, President Bush headed directly back to the White House and another review of the Iraqi dilemma with his top national security advisors. Charles Beerbauer, CNN, Nina, Wisconsin. The CNN Gallup poll that Charles Beerbauer referred to also has some discouraging news for George Bush. More than half the people questioned said that Bush does not deserve to be reelected. In the latest national survey, 55% said he has not earned a second term. 40% said he deserves to be reelected. You know, some people say Bush would start moving upward in the polls if he got rid of some dead weight, namely Dan Quayle. CNN's Bob Franken traveled the campaign trail today with the vice president and has this report. Clearly, the vice president was enjoying this campaign swing, even at the bowling alley. Not very good. True, he did encounter very scattered booing as he addressed the conference of state legislators in Cincinnati. For the most part, the vice president's reception in Cincinnati and Chicago was very friendly. Now that he seemed to be assured of a place on the ticket, he plunged into campaigning. I'll tell you what, I'm not backing down. But questions still lingered about being forced off the ticket. In Chicago, he was repeatedly asked about a Chicago Tribune editorial, calling for him to step aside. That's the same newspaper that had that famous headline, uh, Dewey Beats Truman. Time after time, Quill told reporters the matter was closed. But for many voters, it was still an open issue. In the latest CNN Gallup poll, 40% responded they'd be less likely to vote the Republican ticket if George Bush kept Dan Quayle on it. 22% said they'd be more likely to. 35% believed it would not make much difference. The American people uh, vote for the president. Uh, the American people will be looking at the two presidential candidates and making a choice. Obviously, the vice presidential candidates are there to help the presidential uh, ticket. Uh, but this uh, race is, is going to, to come down on leadership, on uh, qualifications, on trustworthiness, on character between George Bush and Bill Clinton. And when that focus takes place, getting away from all the public opinion polls, uh, the people will then go into the vote, voting booth and make that decision, not some uh, CNN poll. It seems pretty clear that Vice President Quayle, Quayle's presence on the ticket is not a plus. It, in fact, appears to be a minus. But remember something, it was a minus in 1988. Campaign officials say it would have been more damaging to George Bush to remove Dan Quayle from the ticket than not to. Now, the first priority for the vice president is to prove that was the right decision. It is the fondest hope of his supporters that his political skills are better than his bowling. I'm out of here. Bob Franken, CNN, Chicago. Well, the Republicans keep saying that they will win because voters believe that Bush is more qualified than Bill Clinton to be president. But what if it became necessary for the vice president to serve as president? Which number two man do voters believe is qualified to fill the number one spot? According to a CNN Gallup poll, 62% of those questioned said that Quayle is not qualified to serve as president. 32% said that he is qualified and 6% had no opinion. However, 64% of those polled said Al Gore is qualified to serve as president. 19% said Gore is not qualified, and 17% had no opinion. The poll, by the way, has a margin of error of plus or minus three points. Gore has a definite opinion about Bush's handling of the international diplomacy issue. In Atlanta tonight, he said that Bush should meet with Iraqi resistance leaders. Gore says Bush is too ready to support the guy in power rather than making a commitment to people willing to fight for democracy. And the latest CNN Gallup poll also gives a boost to Democrat Bill Clinton. Registered voters were asked which candidate they'd pick if the election were held right now. 56% of those surveyed said that they would cast their ballot for Clinton. 36% said that they would support Bush. Clinton spoke to a National Urban League audience today in San Diego, and CNN national political correspondent Gene Randall has more. Bill Clinton got large percentages of the black vote in the presidential primary, but in fact, relatively few blacks turned out. Clinton's speech to the National Urban League on Monday was part of an effort to energize a traditional Democratic constituency. Clinton would like to forge the same kind of black-white coalition he put together during the primary season, while sharply pushing up his numbers among black voters. Why aren't those jobs 
in the inner cities where people can be put back to work and given the opportunity to go forward. That's what we ought to be about. That's about tomorrow. That's not about liberal or conservative. It's about the future. Still, a sometimes strained relationship with civil rights leader Jesse Jackson could cast a shadow of doubt across Clinton's black voter expectations. In San Diego Monday, some Urban League delegates reflected doubts. Him and Jesse must talk to each other publicly. I think until that happens, there will always be that perception that there is a distance between them. With his bus tour, you only saw a very for people who were representing one particular group, and you didn't see a diversified population. Clinton's Urban League appeal came during a California trip that's included a pitch to a very different group. The setting was Ontario, a Republican stronghold east of Los Angeles. When thousands turned out for a Sunday afternoon rally, Clinton spoke like a conservative. I'm a Democrat who believes in the line item veto and believes in cutting out wasteful government spending. George Bush talks about how conservative he is. I've balanced 11 government budgets. Clinton insists his message has a broad enough appeal to include widely divergent groups. I think there is an overwhelming desire that cuts across race, income, and uh, political party to see this country work for all the people again. President Bush turned down his invitation to address the Urban League. Clinton would use that to buttress his claim, Bush is not interested in reaching out to people. Bill Clinton, in the meantime, carries on with his political balancing act, one whose success or failure could say a lot about his chances for a victory in November. Gene Randall, CNN, San Diego. I'm Patrick Greenlaw. Now let's go back to Bernie Shaw with an update on the Bush-Baker situation. Joining us now, CNN senior White House correspondent, Charles Bierbauer. I got a on right Sunday now. on ABC, <laughs> the Deputy Secretary of State, Lawrence Eagleburger, allowed us how he thought <laughs> Mr. Baker would be Secretary of State for a long time. Yeah, go ahead. Last week, the indication was that Baker was coming to Bush's rescue. Well, okay. I'm okay. Sure with, uh, with, uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, Mr. Eagleburger, got a little bit okay. enthusiastic. Okay. Next and 11 got a story. And that uh, both at the donuts. campaign and at the White House, uh, sources I've talked with It was such a pain coming home to a dark house I was feeling too hot or too cold So we had Honeywell redo everything Now the temperature is always comfortable The lighting's taken care of And we feel a lot safer even the air is cleaner. It's like living in a new house. Honeywell, helping you control your world. Ugh, oh, this itch. What can stop it fast? You need lightning fast lanocaine. Lanocaine starts working in a flash to cool, soothe, stop the itch. And lanocaine cream actually works on contact with the itch nerves that cause every itch. Benadryl can't. Cortaid can't. Cortisone 10 can't. The itch is all gone and so fast. For the fastest way to stop every itch, get lightning fast lanocaine. What is Vibrance? Vibrance is your hair full of life. Vibrance is new shampoos and new conditioners. Vibrance infuses each strand with a healthier life, with deeper shine, livelier color, and a fullness you've always wanted. When your hair's this full of life, it's new Vibrance. Republicans who back abortion rights are taking their act on the road. They kicked off a caravan to Houston today, a high-profile platform for their gripes about the party's anti-abortion stand. CNN's Deborah Potter has more on this latest headache for the Bush camp. With their convention just three weeks away, Republicans who support abortion rights are fighting a last-ditch battle to make the party reflect their views. Party loyalty does not demand capitulation. This issue is far more important than party loyalty. We need to win this fight for the very survival of the party. We need to fight to get our party back to its roots. Abortion rights groups have been lobbying for months to soften the strict anti-abortion language in the Republican platform. But party officials have rejected the effort, and anti-abortion groups predict that won't change. 
the Republican Party taking a strong pro-life stand has elected three presidents under that uh, platform and I firmly believe they will re-elect President George Bush this year with a strong pro-life plank. The Republican split took center stage at the Democratic convention earlier this month as abortion rights Republicans appeared on the podium. But anti-abortion Democrats like Pennsylvania Governor Robert Casey were not allowed to speak. Republican officials say they intend to show that their party is more tolerant. Supporters of abortion rights like Labor Secretary Lynn Martin and California Governor Pete Wilson will have prominent speaking roles. The Republicans do have an opportunity here to neutralize some of the criticism. On the other hand, you know, the troublemakers always can cause trouble if they really want to. With the Bush campaign already in trouble, the last thing party officials want is a divisive fight over abortion. And they intend to do everything possible to keep the issue from coming up on the convention floor. But the abortion rights Republicans say they're not giving up. And they headed off to Houston in what they call a caravan for choice to keep on pressing their case. Deborah Potter, CNN, Washington. In Georgia, GOP Congressman Newt Gingrich's puny primary victory now faces an official second look. A recount has been ordered to start tomorrow. Gingrich, the House Minority Whip, won the primary last week by just 980 votes. He's calling the recount a waste of time. But challenger Herman Clark says anything could happen. Clark cited reports of voting irregularities and asking for the recount. Ahead on this edition of Inside Politics 92, Ross Perot's economic plan. He describes it as dynamic and promises to do whatever he has to to push it. We'll talk live with a man who helped put the plan together, John White. Oh, it was nuts. Absolute chaos. Every day was a different surprise. I can't afford surprises. I had to find something to help me keep this place under control. That's exactly why we got this Honeywell control system. We're more efficient now, conserving raw materials, and turning out a better product. I'm sure we can survive without it, but who just wants to survive? Honeywell, helping you control your world. Sports. Showbiz. Finance. Style. The pros. The cons. The common ground. Food. Advice. Weather. Talk. CNN. We're the news you need and much more. Great financial opportunities are often fleeting. And this one is no exception. The magnificent Jaguar XJS. Its beauty is profound. Its luxury and performance unparalleled. Now at especially attractive lease terms, the XJS Coupe and Convertible are more enticing than ever. But hurry, offers this good don't come down the road very often. For your nearest Jaguar dealer, call toll-free. It was such a pain coming home to a dark house. I was feeling too hot or too cold. So we had Honeywell redo everything. Now the temperature's always comfortable, the lighting's taken care of, and we feel a lot safer. Even the air is cleaner. It's like living in a new house. Honeywell, helping you control your world. Declared White House run, Ross Perot was fond of saying the deficit could be taken care of without breaking a sweat. Well, now that he's out of the race, Perot's unveiled a plan to close the budget gap by 1998. However, you must forget about sweating, and acting it probably would require spilling a lot of political blood. Some of the key components of the plan, according to U.S. News and World Report, raise the top federal income tax bracket from 31 to 33 percent increase taxes on Social Security benefits, impose a tax on some employer-provided health insurance, and hike the gasoline tax by 50 cents a gallon over five years. Even this part of the plan, here, like here. a number of others, is incorporated yeah, from Paul Songus's right. call to economic arms. Pro has been highly complimentary about Songus's blueprint for fiscal austerity. All in all, the Perot plan figures to generate more than $300 billion in new revenue over five years. When it comes to spending cuts, the major proposals are reduce the defense budget by $40 billion more than President Bush advocates over five years, 
require a 10% across-the-board cut in discretionary programs in each federal department and agency, slash Medicare by $83 billion over five years and impose higher premiums on beneficiaries, and cut farm programs for wealthy farmers. The estimated overall savings, $308 billion. And joining us now, the man who was one of the chief architects of Ross Perot's economic plan, he is John White. And Mr. White, let's begin with uh, the news Bernie just expressed, and that is the letter of July 23rd to Delaware saying, I am still a candidate. Is he or isn't he? Well, I think uh, Ross said when he uh, withdrew from the race that uh, the petition drives were going to continue, and, and in those continuing, then I think he has to stipulate under those rules that he is a candidate in order for that to happen. But, but of course, that is a sworn statement under oath that, in fact, he is a candidate. Why is he doing this? Well, I think because uh, he thinks it's what's been going on with the volunteers is very, very important, and some of that activity ought to continue, that it will make a difference in the race. Well, now, what about the economic proposals? Why come forward now? Why not bring those out when he was somewhat, though undeclared, uh, running for the, right, for the presidency? Well, we had planned to do that. In fact, we had had a long meeting last Wednesday, the day before Ross withdrew, and he had agreed at that time that he would make a speech in two weeks laying out his economic plan, and that would be the centerpiece of his campaign in terms of the platform. So we had taken three months to build this plan. It's not an easy thing to do, and he was ready to deliver it. Well, now, why, why did he say you could do this without breaking a sweat? Because there are many issues in here, certainly both in, in uh, raising funds as well as reducing expenditures that are politically, some would say, untenable. Well, I don't think they're untenable. I, I think the American people, when you lay out for them what's involved here and the fact that we are in jeopardy of our leaving our children less well off than we were and how we've been left by our parents unless we do this sort of thing. We have to get this deficit down or we won't have the jobs created and the economic growth we need in order to be a really truly prosperous country again. Was this plan one of the reasons Ross Perot believed he was not electable or if so it would it would divide the vote too much divide the country no not at, not at all we thought uh, running on this plan was good strategy we knew we would take a certain hit in the polls when it was announced but we thought we had time since we would release it between the two conventions and that uh, he would give a speech and explain it he would invite the american people to participate in rebuilding america and in doing so contributing to how the plan ought to be implemented so he's con continued to look for new ideas so we thought it was a good way to, a good strategy to run on. What about uh, inviting Bill Clinton and George Bush to participate? I think that would be just fine. If you look at uh, the elements of this plan, you will see that we have selected uh, different elements from the two, uh, other two parties. And in fact, we have some things that's, that are supported by Governor Clinton and some things supported by the president. What sort of uh, advisory group was put together? What sort of work went into creating this plan? Well, I created a small team of about a, a dozen young folks, mostly uh, graduate students and postgraduate students, very bright and very hardworking. And then we went around the country and called on people and uh, asked them whether they would participate. They didn't have to endorse Mr. Perot. They merely had to help us put together the best plan we could. They, and we had an enormous outpouring of support from experts all over. Well, looking at, looking at both uh, Clinton and, and Bush, many of the proposals coming out of those camps seem to indicate that as the growth uh, of the country turns upward, that that will in fact counterbalance the deficit and you don't have to take more draconian measures that seem to appear in the Perot plan. Oh no, that simply just is not true. The deficit goes down to just over about 220 billion in the middle of this decade and then begins to climb again up towards 300 billion. We simply can't wish away this problem. This is a fundamental problem that we must address as a country. So what is Ross Perot going to do besides issuing forward a plan to, to call the attention of the American people to this, to encourage the candidates, uh, Clinton and Bush, to support these measures? Well, we think that this sort of plan ought to be a benchmark for the political debate that takes place until the election. It's too important to sweep under the rug. And so by uh, putting this plan out, by Ross endorsing it, we think we've contributed to that debate. Well, beyond that, though, he's continuing to put his name on the ballot. Uh, he certainly endorsed it. But what about uh, campaigning for the plan, trying to, to influence those in the Democratic and Republican parties? Are there more tangible activities he has in mind? Well, he has a number of things in mind, but he has not uh, fully decided yet exactly what he will do. All right. And what sorts of things is he considering? Well, certainly uh, speaking out for the plan, 
uh, making uh, speeches about uh, these kinds of issues, continuing to support the activities of the volunteers, and so on. Uh, Paul Songus uh, had some of these proposals, certainly in his economic call to arms, were not necessarily well received in the primary. Certainly he, he uh, fell to Bill Clinton. Why do you think these would be successful with the American people now? Well, because I think uh, it's so important and because I think it can be articulated well in terms of what we need. We cannot go on like this where, in fact, we leave the country worse off than we found it, where our income levels are actually declining over time. Today, it takes 12 generations of Americans to double our standard of living. 15, 20 years ago, it took one and a half generations to double our standard of living. That's unacceptable. We are not being competitive with, uh, with our partners in the, in the rest of the world, and that has to turn around as well. And I think when you explain that to people, they're willing to contribute. Well, realistically speaking, had Ross Perot come out with these proposals, including the higher gas tax, limited tax deductions, increasing, increasing taxes on the wealthy, would he have received the kind of support that we witnessed? Yes, we think so. Uh, we think that this was a good, a good plan and good strategy. We intended to run on this plan. So we will hear more from Mr. Perot on, on this plan. Yes, you will. All right, John White, thank you very much for joining us. Inside Politics 92 continues right after this. Things were out of control. Lighting, awful. Heat. What heat? Superintendent's nightmare. So, in comes Honeywell. They revamp our lighting controls, our heating and cooling equipment. And suddenly we're saving energy, money, a learning environment. 180 degree turn. This school's come a long way. The kids have to. Honeywell. Helping you control your world. to another. Introducing AT&T World Connect service. Now when you're traveling with an AT&T card, country-to-country -country calls are as easy as dialing AT&T USA Direct. AT&T, it's all in the cards. Look at these red marks. These old glasses do nothing but pinch. They're a pain. You don't have to put up with glasses that don't fit anymore. Now Lens Crafters brings you better fit for greater comfort. Lens Crafters glasses fit your snug points with features like new self-adjusting snug fit pads that flex to gently and securely hug your nose. No more pinching. I never knew glasses could be this comfortable. Lens Crafters. Better fit for greater comfort. In about an hour. On CNN Tomorrow, is this really the year of the woman? Gloria Steinem on Morning News. Then on Crier and Company, Women and AIDS, Why Is It Getting Worse? All tomorrow on CNN. And that's all for this edition of Inside Politics 92. I'm Bernard Shaw in Washington. I'm Catherine Crier in Atlanta. Thanks so much for watching. just how much difference there is in life insurance rates from one insurance company to the next? For instance, if you're in good health and don't smoke cigarettes, Garden State Life Insurance may be able to save you as much as 50% off the cost of your life insurance. That's right, 30, 40, 50% off what you'd have to pay for a comparable amount of coverage elsewhere. And not just this month, but year after year for the rest of your life. Savings like that are well worth looking into. So if you need $100,000 to $1 million or more of quality term life insurance, you owe it to yourself to get the facts fast by calling now, 800-257-1257, toll free for this free information package, including a personal coverage proposal that shows you just how much your savings might be. There's no obligation, no sales pressure, and it could be a real eye-opener. For instance, as your Garden State Life representative can tell you, 
If you're a healthy 40-year-old who doesn't smoke cigarettes, you may qualify for $100,000 worth of quality term life insurance at rates so low they're less than 55 cents a day. How do we do it? First, you save because we offer this life insurance at these low rates only to people who are in good health. That cuts our risk and your premiums. Then, because this quality term life insurance is sold in amounts of at least $100,000 or more, you get the advantage of volume discounts. And it's easy to do business with Garden State Life.